Good afternoon, cybersecurity community, and welcome back to the Mile High City. We're here in Denver, Colorado, at MWISE for two days of power-packed coverage. I'm very fortunate to be joined by John Furrier for these fantastic discussions. John, I just want to open up. You published a fantastic piece this morning. Research note, I'm putting on the cube, research.com. Our research channels will continue to crush it. Your research has been amazing on devices, and again, it was a pre- cursor to this show, which we had a great keynote from Kevin Mandy, got great notes on that, love to share that. But my post is really more setting the table around the core themes we're seeing yeah. coming into the show, of which is being reinforced here by the keynote, which is, you know, there's a massive gap between data and security teams, and that's changing, certainly as AI technology rapidly enhances business operations, but yet yeah, has to deal with a massive set of security threats. So, you know, security is one of those data problem areas. It's got a lot of risk management. So you've got a lot of interplay and forces coming together from people, policy, and technology. Um, everything from UX to efficiency on operations, reducing the steps it takes to make the user experience better, workflow uh, management, and ultimately, at the end of the day, balancing the asymmetry between the bad guys and the good guys, as they say, offense and defense. So again, whether it's cyber war, or enterprises defending themselves, it's all about getting more on the offense. So really broke it down all the security risks we're seeing. Um, things like prompt injection attacks, which everyone kind of talks about. Yeah. But training data poisoning. So training data being poisoned is a huge issue. And I think I, I said it in the queue, it's like getting it to kindergartners early. Because um, training is like school. You yeah. train the data and then over time it progresses and then you start inferring from that knowledge. It's like, we, go to, we don't go back to school, we go to school to learn and then we infer and reason off that. Then you go back and study a little bit new, new things, but training data points is huge. And finally, sensitive information disclosures uh, and breaches are huge. So whether that's LLMs infected or hallucinations or drift, um, data is coming out. And so, you know, generative AI is increasing the surface area and is increasing the opportunities for cyber criminals to attack. So again, this is a massive force, it's a market force, and the collaboration between the teams is huge. So questions like cross-functional teams, how do they work better together, getting security teams involved early in all applications, continuously monitoring, guardrails and controls, and then ultimately at the end of that note, I really wanted to get into some specific recommendations from our data, as well as data from the community that we get yeah. on the cube, and also from our experts, and that is, you got to have a, you got to adopt specific security frameworks. It's a lot more OWASP, NIST, others reviewing projects against these frameworks is now becoming more fundamental. Uh, AI-powered security tools, and then governance models. These are areas that people are looking at hard. That's where all the action is, and then, and then applying in the practice again. As AI continues to shape the world, Savannah, as we talk about in the cube, securing these systems is critical. So applications are evolving, the yeah. infrastructure underneath, and ultimately the data in the middle, it's horizontally scalable and vertically specialized. AI plays on both fronts. This is really not an easy thing to do, but people have to take the steps. So that note is all about describing the situation and giving action steps for companies to one, deal with new technologies for efficiency, productivity, but not compromise the security posture. Absolutely. Huge discussion. I think one of the things you're hitting on there as a, as a high level theme and something that I find unique about the cybersecurity sector as relative to other sectors in the tech world is cybersecurity is a team sport. And, and we're stronger together, you know, it's, it's, it's all of us in this room against foreign bad actors and, and a very international threat landscape. I think, I think it's really interesting. I think that one of the conversations we've had that I, I really enjoyed, but we've had, we've had a lot of great guests. We had, we've had Steph, we had Peter, we had Taylor, we had Upin, we had, a, we had a lot of different folks on the stage today. But I like AI as, or AI is UX. I love what Steph said about that. We've been talking about it on the device side. You know this is yeah. one of my favorite spaces. We're not going to think about our devices as being an AI computer or an AI phone. It's just going to be built in, yeah. meeting us where we are, whether that's in the enterprise or as individual consumer. Yeah users out here. Yeah, and the keynote by Kevin Mandy was interesting because new data that came out of that keynote yeah. uh, and the analysis of that is, is that he is clearly always about national security. 
You know, uh, he's got little deference to cyber crime and cyber espionage. Obviously, huge military background. Um, comes from law enforcement, a lot of law enforcement background here. But the increased accelerated importance of cybersecurity becomes huge. Corporate boards and executives are being brought in to things like platform engineering, which we cover at KubeCon, CNCF, and the cloud conversations. Yeah. Those executives point. are being brought in, and people want to know, bottom line, who accepts the risk? Yeah. So if I say, Savannah, you own the risk. You got to sign up for that, raise your hand, and then you're accountable. So what's happening is, is that we're starting to get into the, not the finger pointing, but giving accountability to people. And then- It's necessary. Kevin's always great. He always does his keynote with, these are the questions we're getting. And one of the things was, what boards want? What execs want? So, because risk management goes to the board level, CFOs, big time conversations there. They want to know about maturity, maturity models. Where are we? Size and resources yeah. needed. Our industry specific scope, whether we're delivering applications. What's the industry threat? Trust and reputation. And ultimately leadership at the board level, their risk profile. Yeah. And that's huge. So this is the top questions. And then the, the normal questions are, how good are we? How secure are we when when, when something bad happens? Um, are we good at cyber? Do, how good do we need to be? And what should boards worry about? The answer, bottom line, is, is that it's about all about the breach. And resilience is the number one factor uh, where, the metrics, where the metrics don't really work because cyber resilience is now broad from data backup and recovery. How do we recover from a breach? like ransomware, or resilience of a stock we heard from Taylor who runs all the CISO work at Google. These are the issues. So how do I operate with my critical systems? How do I stress test them? Um, what red teams can do more of? All this is now completely at, at, at full froth, full scale, and it's super important. And they're hard problems to solve. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, you know, it's something that you and I were discussing earlier, and I mean, supply chain is a really big part of the conversation today on a few different axes, but I think the data supply chain is going to become an increasingly more relevant conversation. We've got multiple sources of data, different processes and systems surrounding that data, and as programs like Gemini, as an example, pull together data from all these different areas, how are we going to know that that's all clean, that that's all usable, yeah. that that's all safe, that that's secure? I, there, there's a lot of challenges, I think, for the data supply chain, especially with AI exponentially increasing the amount of data companies and individuals are going to have. Yeah. Well, one one thing that I walked away with so far in day one, we got a whole other day tomorrow, we'll get Kevin Mandy on, he's going to be a great guest, is that what I learned from Taylor's conversation we had with him on earlier is that the Gen AI is an application security problem set, mm -hmm. meaning all the problems that were addressed in application security, it's just another application. So agentic systems is going to be part of an end-to-end -end application. So when you look at that, that is a supply chain problem because when you go at, when you deal with third parties, for instance, like APIs, yeah, you don't want to know what's on the other side, not just saying you're secure. So how do you ensure security end-to-end? -end? And remember, we've seen the evolution of the, soft, the supply chain conversation from hardware, are they built in China? Where's the, where's the, where are these chips coming from at the silicon level? Those continue to go on because as coding goes down to the system level, which is happening right now in Gen AI, we reported on that in theCUBE and SiliconANGLE in theCUBE research, that's happening. Number two, data, data engineering is happening with the platform engineering. Yeah. So you have the confluence of where's the data coming from, where's it going, what's the integrity of the data. And of course, we've been covering software supply chain uh, for a long time. Is the software secure, especially in open source? And finally, this new agentic Gen AI supply yeah. chain. Where's the application getting the data from? What's the integrity of the application? So all levels of the kind of application security we used to see, connecting with the bottoms up security model of supply chain observability are emerging. This is huge. This is a huge point. And this is the first time in my career I've seen both theaters of back end and front end innovation happening at the same time. And what I mean by that is the web was a front end innovation Mobile was a front-end innovation. Yeah, there's some back-end server work, but really front-end innovation. The cloud was a back-end innovation. I think it's a great call out. And then it? now you got back-end and front-end having at the same time, hence our guests with LUX and security on at the same time. So how you deal with the data, whether it's third party or your own, in the cloud or on-prem, uh, data can be leaked, it could be poisoned, and prompt injections are there. This is the cutting edge uh, security paradigm right now. 
on top of an already complex environment, Savannah. So, you know, if you're a tech geek like us, you like it because it's hard problems to solve. Yeah. If you're an enterprise or someone who's a security mindset, you're like, man, red alert all day long. So the game is still the same, balance the asymmetry between offense and defense. How do I stay secure? Are the tools working for me? These are all the questions. These are all the things happening. And again, Kevin Mandian's keynote summarized all that as well as introduced the fact that resilience is huge. I, resili resilience is always huge. And it, it was interesting actually having that discussion with Peter and Steph earlier to really break down what resilience means. And resilience means different things to different companies based on their threat profile and and, yeah. and their risk. So, Well, yeah. you heard Taylor, he said, resilience is hard to nail the metrics. Yeah. And when you when someone accepts the risk, they yeah. accept the metrics because they're now accountable. So, you know, it's a, it's a moving train, it's moving very fast and trying to figure out what's going on is the number one challenge. Again, that's why we do what we do, Savannah. Get the data and get it out there as fast as possible because you know people are trying to navigate the landscape uh, so that they don't have a bad risk profile yeah. and get breached. So everything's on the table. It's really it's an interesting time. It, it is a very interesting. I'm actually I'm just thinking back to KubeCon 2021 in October. We were both there. It's actually when I met the Cube, and the theme at that particular event was resilience realized. And I realize that we're talking about post-pandemic, but I think it's also a very apropos and prophetic theme for what we're seeing right now. I don't think we can have a conversation about cybersecurity without bringing up what's happened in Lebanon this week yeah. between the exploding pagers and now today's event of the exploding walkie-talkies. Very interesting new type of modern warfare. Our, our hearts go out to folks affected by any form of violence. But I do think this is the first of many attacks that we'll see in this new era of combat where our edge devices will be potentially compromised. And you know, when people think about getting hacked, they think of the data on their phone, yeah. they think of the access on their phone or their finances, or say secure information from a nation state. The reality is silicon and and the physical side yeah. of the hardware here can be hacked just yeah. as just as easily depending on the supply chain situation well when you texted me that hat tip to you i wrote um, a tweet about it but that pager and that walkie-talkie incident you put aside all the james bond mr gadget as you you were yeah, yeah. and uh, the man. fact that that happened it really is a stark reminder that companies just can't depend on the technology they got to have strong defenses to secure it and i think that is a great example of taking advantage of pre-existing operational technology devices. Yeah. I mean, pagers, I mean, that's like low tech, but low tech connected. So yeah. again, we depend on these technologies as humans yeah. to survive and thrive, but they gotta be secured. This is a whole nother defense paradigm. And you know, I'm sure we'll spend months unpacking that, but it's a stark reminder, Savannah, that the world's not safe. I, I, I totally agree, and I think one of the things that's interesting, you know, you, we, we talk, you guys were talking about this, with Intel, Apple owns a lot of its own supply chain. A, a lot of companies moving towards having more control over their supply chains. Now, not just because of the silicon shortage or a, a GPU situation, but also because of the quality assurance and to de-risk the manufacturing process of the hardware that they're using, the, the drama that's coming out still very early to your point to, to determine yeah. what happened. But there's there's a company in Taiwan saying it wasn't their factories that made them there. It's a company yeah. in Hungary who apparently licensed it. But the, the initial look and investigation is showing us that it was yeah. a, a supply chain invasion essentially that then led to each of these physical devices, these edge devices being weaponized at a system level. Yeah. And, and I think there's a couple of ways technologically they could have pulled this off, but it is interesting to see that emerge, to watch people try and not take credit for it or to take credit for it, depending on the situation. But you know, when we when we think about when we think about a previous warfare and you think about a weapon, you don't turn to to Glock or to these companies that manufacture yeah. weapons and assume that they're at fault. Now in this case, yeah. you can see Hezbollah very much wanting to point the finger on the manufacturing side and and get to the root of who was in control of that supply chain and manipulating those devices. Well, the thing about that event, as you pointed out, it's national security, it's warfare. You know, this is stark reminders I mentioned. How that translates into cybersecurity for enterprises is now boards are asking themselves, what are the odds something bad is going to happen to us and our things? Because they have humans running 
uh, um, devices as well as other tools and technologies, um, and CEOs and CISOs have to perform realistic simulations, Savannah, testing their cyber resilience. This is the point of my research note. For the folks watching, this is, this is now, we are in game theory meets reality meets fantasy, because who would have thought pagers? So full circle back to the enterprise and CISOs, I'm dealing with a plethora of activities from devices to software to applications. Now I got Gen AI, now I got so much more to worry about. Okay, what if something bad happens? Kevin Mandy said on his keynote today, who accepts the risk, but then he actually brought up something that we cover a lot in theCUBE, which is not always mainstream. What's the cyber resilience on recovery? Right. So Christoph Bertrand and our team handles cyber resilience, which is backup recovery, which combats ransomware, but any breach, what happens after the breach? And everyone right now is running simulations to figure out what if I could have the breach back? What if I get a mulligan? What would I have done differently? Yeah. So all those postmortems can be done with digital twins. In the area of research, if you check out The Economist and go to siliconangle.com and of course, Cube Research, we got a whole thing on how digital twins is coming into not just manufacturing, all process security, marketing, everything. So hope for the best, plan for the worst, but enterprises, it's now moving to national security level tactics. The bad guys are going to come in, and if you're not cyber resilient, again, this definition opens up to a huge aperture, Savannah, as we've been saying on theCUBE. It's not just cyber resilience for, say, back and recovery, or cyber resilience for security stress testing, or application, it's everything. It's a yeah. more holistic approach. Uh, it's every single thing that we touch with our data or our hands, yeah. Yeah. quite frankly. Yeah. I think it's going to be really interesting. Like, like you said in one of our earlier segments, one of the most interesting times to be in technology. Data security is now hot. We even heard, you hear about inf data as code? Yeah, I think we coined the term on theCUBE uh, in 2016, 20 around that time frame. Data is the new uh, asset, mm -hmm. and people want it. And so they're going to use data. I mean, one thing Kevin Manning did say on stage, I thought this was really compelling, is more of a um, cautionary tale. The enemy is going to cyber, using cyber tactics with LinkedIn and scraping the profile because of the skills gap and applying for jobs and getting in. Yep. And then once they're in, they're using the security from inside. So watch out on that too. I mean, these are, this is what Gen AI, the deep fakes, yep. misinformation, but also spoofing was coming to a whole nother level I mean, all you got to do is go on LinkedIn, look at a rock star cyber engineer, who's not going to hire that person? Where's the vetting? Right. What's the process for that? Again, these are new problems that need process, and this is where the Gen AI can really come in and help, background checks. I mean, all kinds of stuff um, we've heard here from Google, threat hunting, yeah. those automations kicking in there. So, you know, I'm a big believer that Gen AI will be a great advocate for the human. Yes. Deloitte calls it human plus, we had them on. So human in a loop, reinforced with human feedback is a big topic that's here as well. So again, a lot of analysis, a lot of a lot of stuff happening already here. Yeah, no, it's 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 super exciting, and honestly, um, yeah, I'm I'm very curious to see how this conversation evolves over the next couple of years. You and one thing we all cannot do is never underestimate the patience nor the creativity of a nefarious actor. They are they are even more patient than most of us, to your point. Yeah, so. I mean, Gen AI, I mean, again, hearing Kevin Mannion say this kind of puts a squash on the whole bubble. He said, quote, the question isn't if you're going to use AI, the question is how, how are you going to securely use it? Mm -hmm. And the reality is he's telling people, your, your users will not not use Gen AI. They're going to use it What's your policy around it, and how are you going to secure it? That's the number one question here at the show this week. Well, we'll have to ask him when we get to have him on the yeah. show this time or tomorrow. Make sure you're tuning in, just like you should be tuning in to our thrilling two days of coverage here in Denver, Colorado at MWISE. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for cybersecurity news.